This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play War Room. War Room was released in 2019 by Nightingale Games and designed by Larry Harris Jr. This game supports up to six players and takes up to six hours or more to play. War Room is an enormous game with over 1,000 components. This promotional image from Nightingale Games gives you an idea of the scope and grandeur of a game in progress. For this first episode of the Harsh Rules Breakdown for War Room, I'm going to focus on teaching you how to set up the game with an overview of mechanics as we go along. This will establish a foundation of knowledge that we will build on in subsequent episodes. We've got a lot to cover here, so let's get started. To set up a game of War Room, first find a play area, a big play area. Assemble the globe map in the center of that play area. War Room's circular game board is organized into sea regions and land territories. Each of these represent geographic spaces with their own unique identifier called region IDs. Learning the layout of these codes are critical to playing the game because each turn players will draft orders to their forces using them. Don't be discouraged though, the coded orders are much simpler than those used in other games. Most orders identify the unit ID, whether that be an air, land, or naval unit, and then its destination. For example, 51U4 means that the 51st, which is a land unit, will move to U4, which is Alaska. Sea regions are organized into the following four groups. The Atlantic Ocean, represented by Sea Region A1 through A19, the Pacific Ocean, P1 through P20, the Indian Ocean, I1 through I10, and finally the Mediterranean Sea, M1 to M6. Now that we understand sea regions, let's learn about groups of territories that form nations. War Room is a World War II strategy war game that pits up to three players as the Axis powers against up to three players representing the Allies. The Axis powers are composed of the following playable nations. Germany, Imperial Japan, and Italy. The Allies' membership is made up of the British Commonwealth, the Soviet Union, the United States, and China. China is not a fully playable nation on its own. Depending on the number of players, China is managed either by the player of the Soviet Union or the United States. In five or six player games, it's the United States. With less players than that, it's the Soviet Union. While the war rages between the major powers, several smaller nations stand outside the conflict as neutrals. Standard neutrals will not enter the conflict unless their territory is invaded by one of the major powers. When units enter a standard neutral for the first time, its status immediately shifts to pro-allied or pro-axis in opposition to the invader. Several of these nations also have their own defense force and will attempt to repel the invaders. If a neutral nation is conquered, and they have resources, they may trade with the conquering group's members. There are also a number of neutral nations that are sympathetic to the Allies. These are known as Allied Neutrals. Allied units may enter or move freely through these nations. However, if Axis forces move into an Allied Neutral, they will activate their defense force, if they have one, and defend themselves. We will discuss neutral nations in more detail when we cover the combat rules in this series. Finally, there are some territories on the game map that are impassable to all land units. This includes the three Sahara Desert territories in Africa and the Himalayas in Asia. Now that we're familiar with the game's map, let's learn about the components needed to set up the common play area. To set up the common play area, you will need the following. The morale board and the two battle status boards. The two reference mats. The unit storage trays. And the common storage tray and dice. 
Next, let's take a closer look at the common storage tray to see which components to place inside. The common token storage tray is the black box with the War Room logo on it. Lift off the lid and you'll find six storage bays inside. You can arrange your own game components however you like, but should include these items. The double-sided bomb and industry tokens. Bomb tokens are used in territories to show infrastructure damage due to strategic bombing raids. Industry tokens are used to mark units under construction. The double-sided arrow tags. Arrow tags are used to keep track of aircraft that must land. Red arrows are for the Axis and blue arrows the Allies. They can also be used to indicate force advantage in battle. There are 30 hotspot markers in the game and they will take up two bays. Hotspot markers are placed in territories in conflict. When placed in a territory, the explosion side is a reminder that a battle must be resolved. The split red-blue side indicates that control of a territory is contested. The territory with this marker is referred to being embattled. Yes, in War Room, battles for territories can span multiple turns. I've organized the last two bays for components dedicated to homeland status. Each nation has a homeland status that tracks its people's morale during the war. Stress markers are used as penalties when a nation loses territories or invades a neutral nation. They come in one and three value markers. When stress builds up, the homeland status can decline through several stages that penalize the nation. To cancel out stress, the player can purchase civilian goods. And on the reverse side of these tokens are medals. Medals can be earned for battle achievements. Medals can also be used to remove stress. We'll look at all of these components later in relation to their respective phases. Now that we've stocked the common token storage tray with components, it's time to look at the personal play areas. Once players select a nation, they will need the following game components to set up their individual play area. First, you'll need that nation's storage tray. I'll show you what components go inside in just a moment. Next, you'll need their card holder and any cards that nation begins the game with. For nations that have a lot of territory cards, there are also blank card holders for overflow. And finally, you'll need that nation's operations and production chart pad, what I like to call the nation's order book, or their little black book. Next, let's take a closer look at the national storage tray. The national storage tray is a key gameplay component for each nation. It doubles as an organizer for game pieces and a base for the resource chart. Slide off the outer sleeve and you'll find the resource chart. Lift out the resource chart to reveal four storage bays. If you flip over the sleeve and place it next to the tray, you'll see that there's an inventory list of all the available command tokens for that nation. This is a good way to check to make sure you have everything you need to play. Command tokens are the way the game organizes air, land, and naval units. Players can organize their nation's components in these trays however they like, but here's one example. The first bay can hold a nation's air command tokens, the second, their land command tokens, and the third, the naval command tokens. The last bay can be used to hold national flag tokens, a set of resource pins, and that nation's territory cards when the game is not being played. For now, keep the cards, a set of resource pins, and the two plastic jumbo flag tokens out as we will use them in setup in just a moment. Once a national storage tray is organized, replace the resource chart. The resource chart is used to keep track of a nation's oil, iron, and OSR, which stands for other strategic resources. Resources are the game's currency that allows players to purchase new military units and bid for turn order. When setting up the game, place a resource pin in the zero row at the bottom of the chart. The red pin is used for oil, the blue pin iron, and the gold pin OSR. There is also a white pin. A white pin is used if any nation's resource exceeds 20. 
If this occurs, leave the colored pin in the 20 space and place the white pin in the 0 space. Then use the white pin to track above 20 resources. Now, let's take a closer look at the territory cards and get ourselves ready to set up the game board. Each nation begins the game with a set of double-sided territory cards. A card's front side represents the territory is at full strength. The back side is used when the territory is in conflict with enemy forces. This is the card's embattled side. Embattled territory stats may be weaker than those on the front side of the card. The back side of the card also has setup information for the territory along the bottom. Now, back to the front side. Running along the top of the territory name is the nation's flag followed by a row of numbered spaces. The first space shows the territory's region ID. Typically this is a letter indicating the nation and a unique number. For example, U1 stands for United States Territory Number 1. Each region ID can be mapped to a specific space on the game board. The U.S. has a total of 10 territories, each with its own card. Other nations may have more or less territories based on their size. Players slot these cards into their card holder to keep track of them. Organizing territory cards sequentially by their region ID may make it easier to keep track of your nation's statistics. The next space shows a territory's strategic value. Several territories in a nation may have a strategic value assigned to them. The greater the value, the more important the territory to the homeland. If the territory is lost, this places stress on the nation that affects the people's morale. As the morale of the homeland declines, the player suffers penalties to gameplay. We'll talk more about homeland status later in this series. The next three spaces indicate the territory's natural resources. These resources are oil, iron, and OSR, which stands for other strategic resources. Resources act as the game's currency and can be used for actions like constructing new military units and bidding for turn order. Some territories may also have an industry icon. This icon indicates that the territory can construct new land, air, and naval units. The number of smokestacks on the industry icon shown on the game map equals the number of units that can be constructed there at one time. However, the icon on the card only shows two smokestacks, but you can also tell how many units it can produce by referencing the strategic value number. For example, the eastern United States can construct up to 10 units at one time. Finally, the territory that contains the nation's capital will have a star on it. You may also notice that some territory cards have a light star with a letter on them, like P. This designation is for playing smaller scenarios that only use a portion of the game board, like War in the Pacific. These lighter stars tell players the key territories that must be captured since the nation's capital may not be in the scenario's theater. The game comes with golden stars to mark the territories on the game board. Now that we've learned about territory cards and region IDs, let's set up these spaces on the game board. For this rules breakdown, I will be using the United States for examples, so let's focus in on their territories. A nation's military forces can be set up in two ways. For the first method, the reverse side of every territory card lists the units to set up there. The land unit command token for this territory is the 51st. You can track down the command token by referencing the number beneath its respective setup section at the bottom of the card. Military units in the game are represented by colored plastic stackers that every player shares. The player will need two yellow infantry units, a blue artillery unit, and two green armor units. Place the 51st command token on top. Collectively, this group is now known as the 51st Command Stack. 
The second way a player can set up their forces is directly from the command token. That command starting region ID is shown on the top half of the token. The colored squares on the right side of the token will tell the player which units to add to the command stack. The completed stack is then placed in the U1 Eastern United States Territory. Air units function in the same way. Identify the air command token for the region, in this case the 11th, then build the stack with two green fighters and a red bomber capped off by the 11th Air Command token. Place this command stack in the U1 Eastern United States space. Finally, build the first Naval Command stack with one blue cruiser, a red battleship, and the first Naval Command token on top. This Naval Command stack is placed in C Region A10. Naval C regions are marked on the setup card as well as the command token itself. A quick note, when setting up naval command stacks, do not be confused by the rings printed on the board with clusters of colored ship icons. These are convoy markers that represent that nation's shipping. Undefended convoys can be raided by the enemy to penalize a nation's resources. We'll talk more about convoys in a later episode. Now that the setup for the first territory card is complete, you will set up command stacks for the remaining cards in the same fashion. Be aware though that some territory cards require command stacks from two nations. For example, Great Britain starts the game with both British and US forces. The Solomon Islands is the only region that starts the game with opposing alliances, the US and the Japanese. When finished, you'll notice you still have extra command tokens that do not have a region ID on them. These tokens can be added to the game later to create new command stacks. Also, later in the game, you may run low on plastic units. When this occurs, you can use multipliers to represent multiple units. A white multiplier unit represents three of the unit directly below it. Now, let's continue with setup. The circle at the top of the globe is the homeland status and turn order track. To set up this section of the game board, let's take a closer look. This wheel track is used to monitor two things, the player turn order and the homeland status of each nation. First, let's discuss turn order. In phase two of the sequence of play, strategic planning, Players write a nation's orders for their turn and may bid oil to improve their turn order rank. If a player doesn't want to spend oil, they can bid zero. Then, once all players have finished writing orders, each nation announces its bid. The nation that bid the most oil may choose which position on the turn order track they'd like to place their flag. The next highest bid selects a position, and so on. Draw national flags randomly to break any ties, including for zero bids. We'll walk through the steps for bidding in the next episode as we work our way through the sequence of play. For now, you can place the round jumbo flag markers on any of the turn order spaces to make sure they're all available. We'll resequence them after the turn order bid in phase two. Now, let's discuss homeland status. The remaining spaces on this chart are dedicated to tracking the morale of each nation. This is known as a nation's homeland status. Each nation's status is tracked with a square jumbo flag marker. When the game begins, these markers are placed on the first space marked Start for acceptable stress. We're going to cover homeland status and the morale board in greater detail in a subsequent episode but here's the general concept. Each nation has a stress threshold that is established by the scenario being played. Stress is created by several events in the game that impact national morale. These include territory losses, invading neutral nations, military unit casualties, and the first player to break the Japanese-Soviet non-aggression pact. These events are translated into stress tokens. And when the stress token amount exceeds a nation's stress threshold, their homeland status declines on the track and they suffer penalties. 
The first level of decline is the blue zone, labor and civil unrest. The nation must pay any three resources, if they're able, in order to restore order to the homeland. Another decline puts the nation into the yellow zone. This disables the nation's railways and naval ports. A decline into the orange zone means disrupted supply lines. Due to depleted morale and disorganization at the front, the nation loses three of their nine orders that they can issue per turn. Another drop in homeland status will leave a nation in the red zone. This is an economic collapse, and no new resources may be added to the nation's resource chart. And the very bottom is the gray zone, mass desertion. At this level, the nation begins losing units from the board equal to their stress points. Now, these penalties are awful on their own, but each drop in homeland status is a cumulative effect. Therefore, you're dealing with the penalties of your new level, but also all the previous penalties as well. A nation can repair their homeland status to a previous level, but it costs them any combination of metals and or civilian goods equal to their stress level, and they can only slide back one zone per round. Now that you have the information to set up the game, we're at a good point to stop and prepare ourselves for the next episode. In the next episode, we will begin learning the sequence of play. So once you get the game set up, check back here to learn more. Before we close out this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.